She wrote this book, Meet Me at the Biltmore, which I had seen written up, and I thought it sounded really very interesting. Um, Amanda is not just a writer, but she um, also runs a nonprofit organization and is a strategic planning consultant and is the mother of a toddler <laughs> and drove here from Warwick, Rhode Island. Now, as an islander, you guys appreciate, she said she thinks she's the farthest point in the state from her house. It's so funny. Um, You're going to so, a little contest. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm on Warwick Neck, so I really had to go all the way. If I had taken the boat, it would be about six minutes. So anyway, thank you so much for coming tonight, yeah. and um, we're looking forward to hearing. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And yes, it was an hour. That's the farthest I've ever driven in this state. And I, I'm from New Jersey. We drive an hour to almost anything, like out to dinner. But it was the furthest I think I've had to go anywhere, um, and still in Rhode Island. But I am so happy to be here and so excited to tell you about my book. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, thank you for that wonderful intro. I am not from the Blount family of Rhode Island. Just. <laughs> Um, I know, for me too, though I brought my father to their clam shack in Warren and he showed them his license and asked for a discount. It was very awkward for the poor 14 year old behind the counter and my dad got a real hoot out of it, but we are not from Rhode Island, unfortunately, though sometimes I think way back maybe we all were just from the same family, but my family's from Mississippi and Texas and um, I grew up in New Jersey, um, but I came to Rhode Island five years ago. I hold a degree in history from Rutgers University, though my career has led me down a path of nonprofit management and social work. Um, but history is truly my first love and um, I absolutely adore it. I, everything I do, my travels, my thinking about how I wanna raise my daughter, all of the things, they're all sort of framed through the lens of um, history and upholding the important um, elements of history in American culture as well as around the world. So um, that's, a little bit about me. I came to Rhode Island five years ago and I vowed that uh, when we got ourselves settled, my husband and I, I would start to read books about the state because I actually knew nothing about Rhode Island um, when we moved here. Um, but I had heard that it had a very compelling history and I wanted to know more. I'm from Princeton, New Jersey, so we also have a very compelling history. Um, and interestingly, there is quite a few linkages between New Jersey, uh, central New Jersey history and Rhode Island. So I had a little bit of that in my mind. Um, but I thought I would start by reading books. Um, I mean, I always start by reading general textbooks. And then I thought I would read about some of the historic buildings. We were living in Providence at the time. And um, I had heard about this amazing hotel. And I thought, well, what better way to get to know a town than to read about the central hotel in it because everybody knows that hotels are great vessels for stories. I called the Historic Society and the Library and the Preservation Society and lo and behold, no one had a book about the Biltmore Hotel. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, there were books about other hotels in Rhode Island, but none about the Biltmore. Uh, and so I said, well, someday maybe I'll research this hotel on my own. And I went about my day and you know, ran my business and <laughs> had a child and forgot all about the Biltmore. Then um, March 2020 hit and it was the pandemic and we were all stuck at home and we were trying to fill our time and I do not bake bread. So um, even though everyone else seemed to be doing that, I am a terrible baker in fact. Um, so I started to do what I love doing, which is to read. Um, and as I was reading, I remembered the Biltmore Hotel. Um, in fact, it had recently um, become more prominent in the news in Providence as well, because 
right before the pandemic, they had changed the name from the Providence Biltmore, which it had been for 98 years, to the Graduate Providence. Uh, so it was kind of in the forefront of my mind, and I thought, oh, that hotel, I really wanted to read about that. So I, I knew there was no book on it. I'd already figured that out. And I thought, well, I'll just go into the historic journal archives, the Providence Journal Archives, and start there. Just to give you a sense of uh, where my journey took me, um, the Providence Journal Archives are not actually available online to the public, uh, which is very unfortunate. They are owned by a private institution called NewsBank, and NewsBank leases them to institutions that can afford them. Long story short, um, basically the only institutions that have all of the Providence Journal Archives are universities, and as I am not a faculty member or an alumni, I was not granted access to any of those. But the Community College of Rhode Island was able to give me access, um, even though I was unaffiliated because they're a public institution. So this is my plug for public institutions being so great. Um, however, it was March 2020 and it was the pandemic and uh, no one was allowed in any buildings because we didn't want to breathe each other's air. So uh, they said, you can absolutely access our journal archives. Welcome to Rhode Island. We're so happy you're doing research here. Uh, but you can't come in the building, so you'll have to do this from the parking lot. <laughs> I said, okay, thank you. So they gave me faculty level access to their archives, which was incredible. Um, but I did have to sit in my car um, because no one was allowed on the campus. And technically my car was still my personal space, I guess they, was the way they thought about it. Um, and so I sat in the car. Um, I spent 380 hours approximately uh, in my Toyota. Um, over the course of two years, downloading Providence Journal Archive um, newspaper articles. Um, all in, I downloaded 14,000 pages onto my laptop and crashed it. Um, but fortunately, I had backed it up, um, and I have a new laptop. Um, but what I basically did was I started from 1915, and I typed in the word Biltmore, and I read the entire history of the Biltmore as told by the Providence Journal newspaper. Um, that might sound like the worst way to spend a pandemic, but when everyone else was panicking about the presidency and the pandemic and everything going on in this country that was, and social justice and everything else, um, I was deeply immersed in World War I and World War II and the civil rights movement and all of the other things that had happened. And in a way, it was actually very cathartic to be hiding in history um, during this very uncertain time. What resulted is um, this book that uh, is my first book, and maybe my last because it was very hard to write, um, but it was uh, a pleasure to learn about your state of Rhode Island through the lens of this iconic building, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the building tonight. Um, for those who haven't been to the Biltmore, this is um, what it looks like, if I can get my clicker to go the right direction. This is the Biltmore Hotel as it looks today. Um, as you can see, the neon sign on the roof, it also has a glass elevator that goes up the middle. Um, well, it's almost what it looks like today. It's actually missing its new sign that says The Graduate, but uh, on, the, on the lower level. But this is what most people think of when they think of the Biltmore Hotel. And this is what I saw when I moved here in 2018. Now that I've done my research, what I see when I look at this hotel are the faces of people like Judy Flint and Walter O'Hara, uh, Eleonora Sears, Raymond Petriarca, Antoine Gazda, JFK, Babe Ruth, the Von Trapp family singers, Ronald Reagan, the Rolling Stones, Klaus von Bülow, Maya Angelou, that guy, and Cher, and many, 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 many others. This is just a snapshot of some of the people that when I now look at the Biltmore, this is what I see. The Biltmore is really, to me, just a vessel of stories, a way of telling history. Um, I don't know anything about architecture, and I'll be honest, I, I didn't research it for the book. Um, so if you're looking for a talk on the history of the building, actually, from an architectural standpoint, this is not that talk. Um, this is going to be a talk about these people and why um, they stayed at or were imprisoned in or worked at or committed crimes um, at the Biltmore Hotel. Or in the case of the Rolling Stones, just trashed their suite and then left. Um, 
But it all started actually with this article, because before I could access the Providence Journal archives, I only had access to what I had at home, which was the New York Times archives, which is publicly available if you are a member or have a subscription. Um, this was the very first article that I read about the Biltmore Hotel. This is from July 1921. It is not the first article written about the hotel. It was just the first one I found. Um, but not only did it sort of make me laugh, um, but it, it made me start my research with the question, why is the New York Times in 1921 interested in a hotel that is being constructed in Providence? Again, I'm not from Rhode Island. You all are probably historians, and um, you might laugh because I don't know some of the things that I'm about to say. But at the time, I said, why would New York, why would New York City, why would the epicenter of the world, sort of, in some minds, um, really care about a hotel being built in Providence? And so I wrote uh, this sentence across the top of my notepad, and I set out to answer it. Why was Providence important? What I found was that Providence was not only important, it was actually the center of the manufacturing world in 1920. Um, over the course of the, the three decades after the Civil War, uh, Rhode Island's economy had tripled. Everything in the world that was being produced um, of any major uh, name or of any major um, material was probably being produced at least in part in Rhode Island. Um, every kind of household name from Fruit of the Loom to um, Perry Davis's Painkiller to uh, Corliss Steam to Gorham Silver, uh, everyone had manufacturing headquarters in Providence. This image of Providence from um, the early 20th century was not the image of Providence in March 2020 when I was doing my research in my Toyota in the parking lot. However, it did strike some really interesting questions to me because when I look at a picture like this, I think to myself, what was happening in this city that was so important? And then why not only were all of these people here, um, but what happened to this city uh, that it doesn't look like this anymore. What I started to find out was that um, not only had an incredible amount of production started taking place after the Civil War and at the turn of the 20th century, um, but with that, an incredible amount of labor was needed in all the mills that were the mills and factories that were being built up across the state. With that came um, a huge influx of immigrants. 71% um, of Rhode Island in 1920 was designated foreign stock. So 71% of the state essentially were immigrants or children of immigrants. Uh, not only that, the middle class was ballooning because with all of this money and investment that was coming in, um, lots more people were becoming wealthy beyond just the millionaires, but there was this huge middle class. And with that middle class came the development of tons of infrastructure. Uh, from railroads and roads, but also banks and theaters and schools and hospitals. Everything was going up at rapid speed. Um, so from 1900 to 1920, the construction was just uh, booming across the state, but particularly in Providence. What was also happening was that at the end of the day, especially on a Friday, all of the businessmen and women who were coming into Providence on the trains at Union Station um, were leaving. And part of the reason they were leaving was that there was no luxury hotel in Providence. In fact, really there wasn't a luxury hotel in the state by the standards of uh, New York and Chicago and Boston. That was uh, really bad for business, particularly the business of this guy over here with the mustache, um, Edward Albee. Edward Albee is the grandfather of the famous playwright Edward Albee who wrote Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and a few other really important plays. But um, this Edward Albee, um, he was a vaudeville theater owner in Providence and of theaters across the country. What he saw um, from that previous picture were a lot of people with a lot of money leaving the city before they could go to his shows. He wrote a letter to this guy, the mayor of Providence, and he said that he would offer $25,000 of his own money if the city of Providence would construct a luxury hotel. Not only was this a very... Uh, enticing offer, but it wasn't the first. Many business owners had been calling for a luxury hotel to be built in Providence. This was one of the most uh, important cities in America at the time, and really they were saying, essentially, um, people are taking a train three hours to New York just to find suitable accommodations. That cannot stand. The mayor brought this uh, proposition to the Chamber of Commerce, 
and the Chamber of Commerce started to look for sites that if they were able to raise money, uh, where they would build a hotel. This is um, a photo from 1915, so about five years before this uh, discussion was being had, um, of the site of the Biltmore Hotel. Uh, it was called Butts Block. It was owned by George Butts, who had leased it out to all of these different automotive um, and mechanic shops. It was sort of a, a central spot in the city where you could go and take your car um, or any other vehicle um, or wagon to be repaired. The Chamber of Commerce set about um, working a deal with uh, George Butts to purchase this site. Um, and they essentially gave him an IOU and said, we'd like to buy the site and we'd like to tear it all down and uh, we'll pay you back later. Um, and he actually said, okay. So they tore the site down and um, they set about trying to figure out what kind of hotel they wanted to build. They turned to a manual, um, as many, many uh, hoteliers were doing at the time, written by this man. Um, I'm just going to read an excerpt from my book, if that's all right, um, about this gentleman, because I think that um, I will not give you all of the best details if I don't remember it, if I try to do it off the top of my head. So one of the things um, that was really important about that site that I just showed you, um, and if you know where the Biltmore in Providence is, is that it was catacorner to Union Station. Um, Union Station was the primary train station uh, in Providence at the time. Uh, it is still there, the building, but it is no longer our train station. Um, but it was walking distance. I mean, essentially it was from here to across the street, you know, or to that stop, you know, traffic light. So very, very close. Um, and that was important because, and this is from my book, the proximity to the train station was key. All successful luxury hotels of this era were built in close proximity to train stations. The first known book on hotel management was written in 1848 by an African-American abolitionist, pastor, and community organizer by the name of Tunis Campbell. That's this gentleman here. He outlined the railway hotel connection explicitly in his book. After working as the head waiter at the Ho um, Howard Hotel in New York City early in life, Campbell published the seminal work Hotel Keepers, Head Waiters, and Housekeepers Guide. In it, Campbell insisted that every hotel manager must be intimately familiar with the network of transportation and accommodation in his region. A.K. Sandoval Strauss notes in his book, Hotel, an American History, that Campbell pioneered modern hospitality service, which recognized the integral role that hotel managers must play in the comprehensive travel experience of each guest. So this might sound really obvious to us now because you know when you like go on Expedia, they offer you a hotel the second you book your car. Um, but this was pretty profound for the time because the hospitality industry was just beginning to be developed. Um, hotels are uniquely American by design. Europe had villas and castles and estates, uh, but America really developed the hotel. And hotels were typically along railway lines and, and roads um, for the traveling salesmen, typically. This was a new era of ultra wealthy people wanting to travel to different cities where they didn't live and do things they would normally do privately in their home, like eat and dance and listen to music. Um, and so this gentleman, among many others in the hospitality industry, were really at the forefront of thinking about how do we make this an experience for people? How do we ensure that the ballroom and the dining car, or the dining room and the ballroom are set um, on the same timetable as the trains and on the same timetable as the steamship. So everything works perfectly for these wealthy travelers. Another man who was thinking about this was this gentleman, John Bowman. John Bowman uh, was the general manager of the New York Biltmore Hotel. It was the first in the Biltmore chain. The Providence Biltmore would be the second. John Bowman uh, had built and had overseen the building of the New York Biltmore under the uh, financing of the New York Central Railway, which was a Vanderbilt company, of course. Um, as we all know, especially in this area, you know. Um, and the Vanderbilts gave all of the hotels that they invested in Vanderbilt names, which is how the Biltmore name came to be. They already had the Biltmore estate in Asheville. And they've kind of figured, well, everyone already knows that the Asheville estate is pretty much the nicest house in the world. So we'll just slap that name on our hotels and everyone will just believe that these are going to be the nicest hotels. That was really their thinking. Like, it's a branding choice. Um, John Bowman didn't have much of a choice in that, but he also thought it was a pretty good idea. Uh, so he built this hotel in New York uh, with Vanderbilt money and put the Vanderbilt name on it. And he became 
the sole owner of the Bowman Biltmore Corporation. The Chamber of Commerce uh, was very interested in uh, John Bowman because he was called by McLean's Magazine at the time the fairy prince of the hotel world. He was developing the most luxurious hotels in the country. Um, he was scoping out hotels all over to expand his Biltmore chain and everyone thought that he was uh, very quite, very, quite brilliant and also very good at his job um, and they really thought that it would be the standard of hotel that they, that they wanted. The Chamber of Commerce then um, offer, essentially offered him the job and the hotel and they worked out a deal that said that the Chamber of Commerce would fundraise $2.5 million and John Bowman would cover the rest um, or at least a big portion of it and then they got a mortgage. Um, John Bowman loved Providence. He also really loved Rhode Island because uh, he was very, very, very against prohibition and Rhode Island was the only state other than Connecticut that hadn't ratified the 18th Amendment. So uh, he was all in because I think he saw himself very comfortably drinking whiskey at this hotel in Providence where it was much harder to do at his hotels in New York. The Chamber of Commerce launched a public financing campaign to raise the funds for this new hotel. This is an advertisement that they, uh, that they ran. I'm also going to read you um, the text from another ad that I um, thought was very funny. Just You can picture me laughing alone in my car in the parking lot. Um, and if you need more to add to that image, I was like six months pregnant. So I had, I had my laptop sort of balanced on my stomach and like I was reading these things and laughing to myself. It was, I had a good time during the pandemic, really. Um, so here's one ad. The, uh, the Chamber of Commerce spared n no expense in guilting the heck out of everyone to try to get them to, uh, and anyone could contribute. You could contribute $5 to this campaign. There was no minimum, uh, minimum stock. So. Uh, here's one ad. This is one, um, I really, I showed this one because I actually really like the emblem, the do it for Providence that had the hotel on one side and the 7% return on the other, but I like the text from this one in particular. Um, I thought this was uh, very convincing, if not rude. Night after night, the trains carry away from Providence those who find it impossible to secure a night's lodging here. Back they come in the morning, these men and women whose wares our merchants must buy whose ideas our manufacturers must know of, whose money would help make a better business in Providence. A fine taste of hospitality they get, a wonderful impression of progressiveness they conceive of us. You can imagine what traveling men say, how the news is spread as they while away time in the smokers. Even Pullman porters, ever ready to advertise the first time visitor, put the jinx mark on our doorstep with their stories of the lack of hotel facilities here. This must be stopped not by continued grumbling at conditions as they are, but by a real earnest effort to put through the plan which public-spirited men have labored long and arduously to bring to a head. You'll have your chance next week. You'll have your chance to help wipe out the city's greatest blot. Look eagerly for news of the Providence Biltmore Hotel, the campaign which opens next Tuesday. Get a copy of the prospectus. All details are contained in it. Most banks and the Chamber of Commerce have a supply ready for you. That was a full page ad in the newspaper, so they really were sparing no expense. But they were successful. Um, all in all, pretty successful. They didn't raise the full amount that they wanted to raise. However, uh, they did raise um, about $2 million from the public over uh, the course of three months, and the hotel was secured. They then had to go about uh, designing the hotel. Um, this is a photograph of the of during the construction of the hotel. Um, Warren and Wetmore, the architects um, from New York and a preferred architect team from the Van Vanderbilt family were engaged to, to build the hotel. They, they also had built the Newport Country Club and the Commodore Hotel, the Biltmore Hotel in New York, Grand Central Station and another, many others. Um, they designed this hotel to have all outward facing rooms, meaning every room had a window. That was almost unheard of at the time because um, many hotels, most hotels had inside rooms which were cheaper and outside rooms which had windows and were more expensive. It was always also going to be the most technologically advanced hotel of its time and the most fireproof. And that was particularly important because hotels were burning down pretty much as quickly as they were being built. Um, you can imagine uh, it is, if you cast your mind, it is you know, 1920. Uh, the use of chemicals is very widespread because everyone is dyeing things different colors and creating all sorts of things like automobiles and trying to figure out how to solve 
engine racket in their cars, so they're pouring all sorts of ethene and all these other chemicals into things. There was literally so much combustible energy and, and chemical everywhere. Um, and then everyone smoked. So things were just blowing up left and right, um, including hotels. Um, and um, people really did not want this hotel in particular to burn down. So they constructed it with a steel frame, which was uh, very, very new in construction. Um, and they overlaid uh, brick. And that is all I know about the architecture. You'll have to ask somebody else um, for more details. But this is a photo of the lobby um, at when the hotel was opened. And you can see how luxurious um, it was. It was also on the second floor. If you've been to the hotel in the past 60 years, um, then you will know that their lobby has been on the first floor uh, for a long time. But when it was first built, the first floor of the hotel was all commercial space, intended to be an experience, again, for guests. Uh, you were intended to walk into the hotel and see a grocer and a barber shop and a uh, hair salon and a, a cafe and bakery, and then whisk your way up the grand staircase into this beautiful, serene, peaceful lobby um, quite literally lifting you off of your feet was the design of the hotel. And then the third floor mezzanine looked down onto all of that. Opening day was a smashing success. 2,000 people attended by invite only from all over the United States, including many, many prominent politicians, businessmen, and hoteliers from other hotels across the country. This is, um, you see Lou Wallach in the top of uh, your left corner and John Bowman, they were co-owners of the hotel. Lou Wallach was brought in as a partner by John Bowman on this, um, uh, on this build. Um, I think the most important piece to me about opening day was that not only were 2,000 people invited and 2,000 people by invite only were dined and wined and dined in the ballroom that night, but 50,000 people were lined up outside the hotel just to see who had made the invite list. Um, so in 90 degree heat on June 6, 1922, uh, 50,000 people, which I'm, I think is actually more than the amount of people who live in downtown Providence in, now in total, um, were lined up all around this hotel just to see people getting off of their Pullman cars at the train station and walking across um, the mall here. Uh, it was quite a parade. There was a 50 piece orchestra, live orchestra playing from the terrace there in the corner of the hotel. Um, and uh, the hotel management spared no expense. I include in my book some really fun, I think really fun and interesting local um, characters, um, many of which I don't have time to get into in these talks, but there was one gentleman at the talk, or at the opening that um, named Duty Flint. He was Henry Ford's uh, most prominent automobile dealer at the time. He lived in Providence, well, he lived in Edgewood, um, and actually he, ha he brought 200 of his Ford motor cars from his various dealerships and picked up 200 of his favorite guests and actually drove them out to Edgewood to show them how beautiful his house was before driving them back to the hotel for their tour. Um, he also thought that Providence wasn't a very beautiful city, so he wanted them to see Edgewood and the Narragansett Bay, which he felt were more beautiful. So he had them come out for about 20 minutes. He played them one song on his gigantic pipe organ and gave them sandwiches and then drove them all back to the hotel. Um, but there are lots of stories like this about opening day and, and those early years. This is actually from a month later, but I like to kind of give a visual of what it may have looked like. Um, this was another incredibly popular day at the Biltmore Hotel. This was the day Charles Lindbergh visited the hotel and gave a speech um, during his aero tour promoting the development of private airfields around the United States. Um, I particularly like this because of the, you can see all of the cars and Union Station um, with the hotel here on the left. And one can imagine that um, this is probably very similar to what opening day looked like. Though I couldn't find a photograph of opening day, unfortunately. Um, the hotel uh, was extremely popular and extremely successful for its first 20 years. Um, throughout the 1920s, it was a central place where one could go to find whatever sort of beverage they were looking for. Um, there was a speakeasy right across the street on Eddy Street, and waiters would go down the back stairs with huge buckets and fill them up at the speakeasy and take them up 17 flights of stairs to the ballroom. Um, they didn't want to take them in the elevator, so they didn't want it to spill and make the elevator smell like alcohol because there were prohibition agents everywhere. Bootleggers also lived at the hotel. There were lots of permanent residents of the hotel, keeping in mind that hotels and apartment buildings were synonymous in that, t in that time. You could 
just as easily live at a hotel as you could visit one. So, uh, well, if you had the right amount of money. Barnett Hart was a prominent bootlegger there at the time. Um, he lived in a suite at the hotel as well as in a suite at a hotel in New York until he was arrested. Um, and Raymond Petriarca was actually a 12-year-old bellhop at the hotel. It was his first job after he left school. And um, one can imagine that he got his entree to some of the more lucrative career paths that were out there by some of the people for whom he held the door open to at the hotel. The manager of the hotel was actually one of the owner's sons. Uh, this is Dwayne Wallach. He became very famous for his farm to table approach. These are his chicken coops on the top of the hotel, but he also had herb gardens and lettuce gardens and a few other um, uh, sort of farm to table things. I think he tried to, he tried to have ducks, but they migrated south. He had like a, some failed attempts at things, but uh, for the most part, he was actually uh, very well known for this, for this farm to table, as we call it now approach. But he also had um, more exotic interests. He, on the other side, um, not shown in this picture, he had a, um, a zoo of his private animal collection, which he would show to only his favorite guests and VIP visitors. Uh, the zoo included chimpanzees and alligators and a bear, uh, raccoons, snapping turtles, um, and a flamingo. Um, and he kept that zoo there for over 10 years um, and uh, he did allow a uh, reporter one time to come up and do a special and take some photos after two of the chimpanzees um, had given birth to a baby monkey. Um, but other than that, it was a pretty private affair. And then sadly, um, all of the animals mysteriously disappeared right after the stock market crashed. I very much hope that that was because he freed them and not because he ate them, but times were very hard. This is an advertisement just inviting people to come live at the hotel, which I think is just a wonderful testament to how luxury hotels were at the time. Um, as you can see, it was quite affordable, $52 a month. Um, but these were very luxurious suites. And one must keep in mind that uh, after 1929, a lot of people had lost quite a bit of money. Really, after 1913, with, money had been slowly being lost. Um, first, income taxes became a thing, and that was really bad for the Vanderbilts and their friends. Um, and then the stock market crashed and so many people lost their fortunes and the middle class was particularly hit very, very hard during that time. Um, living at a place like the Biltmore or another luxury hotel was a way to maintain your luxurious lifestyle without having to pay your entire own staff. Um, so this was seen as a really nice alternative, especially during the 1930s, uh, late 20s and, and into the 30s, to having your own estate. You would still have chefs, you would still have ballrooms, you would still have doormen and butlers and, and maids, um, but they wouldn't be your private staff and you didn't have to employ them all or feed them all or take care of their children. Um, so actually, hotels became really lovely alternatives for those who uh, still wanted luxury but not their own estates. There were many, many Providence families who opted to move into the Biltmore. Um, this is just an example of one of the headlines that uh, took me down a very, very, very long rabbit hole in my research. Um, for a moment, I thought I'd stop writing this book and just write a book about Henrietta Gibson because she is a fascinating character. Um, but just to give you a brief moment on Henrietta, she uh, married a man on his deathbed and um, inherited a tremendous fortune from him. And um, strangely, the will was lost the moment he died and her, his mother came in and took her to court and stripped her of the fortune, um, you know, in terms of the day, sort of calling her a gold digger. Um, she went back to her home in Providence. Then her father died and left her everything of his estate, stripping away the fortune for her brothers, um, which they obviously didn't like. So they took poor Henrietta to court, stripped her of her fortune again. Uh, she was left with just the house and a meager half a million dollars. Um, and then she decided to board up the old family home, which was um, on the west side of Providence by the Armory Building, and move into the Biltmore um, as a wealthy recluse, unmarried with no children. When she died at the Biltmore um, in the 19, mm, early 30s, early 40s, I can't remember the exact date, um, she left, um, wait one second here. Yeah, I think, I don't think I have the date on this one. I don't, yeah, thought I did for a second. Um, she left her fortune to her favorite niece, and you can imagine, because of her poor luck, what happened um, after she died and left her fortune to her niece. Her fortune was taken to court again 
um, and they deemed that uh, the niece had been somehow nefarious in this, and they stripped the niece of the fortune and they divvied it up amongst all the other family members. Henrietta has a very compelling story. She got a whole chapter in the book, but um, she also exemplifies the type of Providence elite that were living at the hotel through its first 25 years. It was also not spared tragedy, the hotel or the city or the state. This is a photo from the 1938 hurricane looking down from City Hall at the road between the hotel and City Hall. Um, you can see just the tops of the cars and the water swirling about. Um, the, the hurricane uh, obviously destroyed so much of this state. Um, it was completely unannounced and a terrible, terrible tragedy. The hotel, um, too, was not spared. All of the windows in the ballroom were completely um, blown out. Um, cascading glass filled the room. Um, all the power went out, and there were 12 feet of water uh, through um, all the way up into the lobby, up to that second floor. World War II also did not spare the hotel. There were blackouts. There were rations. Um, certainly, times became very, very, very hard for the hotel. Um, and um, the hotel at one point was actually scoped out to be closed and opened as a medical uh, military hospital should the um, war come home um, to the United States. Um, we are all obviously very fortunate for lots of reasons that that did not happen. During this era, the Bacante Lounge was opened. Um, this is one of the more famous and um, for many people from Providence, um, Beloved memories, um, it was a, one of the first cocktail lounges in the city. Um, very specific to how we think of cocktail lounges now, um, women who dressed um, like this and served cocktails um, in a very dark room with very scant lighting. Um, but in one quote that I found in an interview from one of these lovely ladies, um, it said that New York had its play Playboy bunnies and we had our Bacante girls. Um, the Sheridan Corporation bought the hotel for its first changeover in 1947 um, and uh, really retooled the hotel to be a hotel for the middle class. Um, the 1950s and 1960s saw a lot of change in America on every front, um, but one of those fronts was that um, the middle class was growing and people were traveling. Um, automobiles were becoming very popular and because of that, people were able to travel with their families to different cities in a much more affordable and quick way. Um, and as you can see from this ad, even um, big luxury hotels were becoming motor inns. Nothing about this hotel was a motor inn, um, but they just added it onto the name so that people would know that uh, certainly if you wanted to, you could drive your car to the Biltmore Hotel. It was also during this time that the hotel joined um, or was listed in, um, opted to be listed in the Negro Motorist Green Book, um, which signaled to African American travelers that the hotel was a safe establishment for them should they choose to stay there. Um, this was the only photograph, so I spent a lot of time trying to find out when that neon sign was put on top of the hotel and I could not find it. I couldn't find anything about it, though I don't, I don't think it doesn't exist, I think I just didn't have time. Um, but. Uh, this was the only photograph I could find that verified for me that the hotel sign was put up in the 1960s. Um, and so it says Sheridan Biltmore on the front, but you can just see a tiny bit of a sliver of neon at the top. Um, my hunch was that it had been put up in the 60s because that's when neon became very, very popular. Um, but again, without the Preservation Society or the Historical Society knowing, we just sort of had to guess. But this was uh, for anyone who's interested in the in neon sign. Um, this was the first piece of evidence that we could find the Historic Society and I uh, as indicating when the sign was put up. It is now on the Historic Registry and will remain up there even though it's no longer the Biltmore. Um, Sheridan also started their own television show. It was called Breakfast at the Biltmore. Um, this is just a photo, uh, this is just a uh, postcard that I put a title on because unfortunately it was a live television show Videotape had not yet been introduced in television, so there are no records of the TV show. I did interview folks who had been on the show or seen the show, so I know it existed. Um, it was um, filmed through the WJAR out of the outlet company down the street. Um, they came over and they would film a live breakfast show where people would come and eat breakfast at the Biltmore, which nobody went out for breakfast then, so this was actually um, a, a very exciting thing to do. You would go out and get your eggs and toast at a hotel, 
and you would be interviewed by live MCs about your opinion about things that were going on uh, in popular culture. And then there would be you know, musical acts and things like that. Um, so Breakfast at the Biltmore was very popular. It was aired seven days a week for over 10 years. Um, and people loved it and the hotel loved it because as I mentioned, uh, no one ever went out for breakfast. This was a great way to increase your breakfast receipts uh, at the hotel because everyone was clamoring to get on live TV. Another really important and notable moment was that this gentleman stayed at the hotel the night before he was elected president. Um, the Providence Biltmore Hotel was the last stop on the Kennedy tour bus. Um, the night before election day, he stayed there. Um, he woke up in the morning and read the paper to see uh, what they were projecting for the election. And then he left the hotel um, and greeted, this is a photo of him greeting the masses um, in front of City Hall. Uh, later that day, Rhode Island gave um, JFK the most votes per capita um, of any state. Also, I should note that um, that was not his first time at the hotel. He had been there many, many times. And uh, he, as a Navy, uh, when he was in the Navy and stationed in Rhode Island, spent quite a bit of time in that Picante Lounge that we were talking about before. Um, there were a number of other notable bar rooms and restaurants in the hotel. This is the Falstaff Room. Um, this was a men's only bar until 1974. Um, in fact, th at this very bar, on those very bar stools, um, a sit-in was held by women from Pembroke College, which became Brown, um, a sit-in to demand um, the overturning of discriminatory laws in, in Rhode Island that still allowed uh, bars to discriminate against women. That took place in 1971. It was because of the sit-in at this bar that the law was overturned in Rhode Island and bar owners were no longer given the discretion to ban women at the bar. In my book, um, if we had a little more time, I don't think we'd have time right now, but um, I have a whole list of quotes from male bar owners uh, on their responses to the overturning of that law that are both colorful and offensive. Um, so if that's your kind of thing and you like to laugh about how men used to speak publicly about women, it's in the book. I think it's funny. I have a very dark sense of humor, um, but I'll leave that to you. In January 1975, the electric company turned off the power to the Biltmore Hotel. Sheraton, a few years prior, had sold the hotel to two investors from New York. Uh, they had sold off a lot of their historic buildings in a merger with another company, um, and they did not want to maintain these big, old, beautiful, iconic hotels anymore. They were not cost effective. The two investors from New York had never come to Providence. They never stepped foot in the hotel, and they ran it into the ground. Uh, they never paid their utility bills, um, and that is actually what ended up causing the closure of the hotel. Um, that same day, um, or that same week, this gentleman was being sworn into office. Um, Buddy Cianci became mayor of Providence in January 1975, and while he was giving his acceptance speech on the steps of City Hall, the grand piano was being wheeled out of the front door of the Biltmore. He turned and he said, I promise you, I'll take care of that. Um, which he was really good at saying, um, but in this case, uh, he actually was responsible for saving the Biltmore. He loved the Biltmore, he loved drinking at the Biltmore, he loved partying at the Biltmore, he loved eating at the Biltmore, and he was devastated that the day he became mayor, the Biltmore closed. Um, so he set about in his first term of office to make sure that the Biltmore was saved, um, along with a few other historic buildings in Providence. He got the uh, hotel listed on the National Register of Historic Places. He did this so that he could access federal grants to renovate the building as a historic building. Um, and he worked alongside Bruce Sunlin and Michael Metcalf of the Journal, Sunlin of Outlet Company and Michael Metcalf of the Journal um, to recuperate the Biltmore um, and then to hire someone to completely renovate it. They installed the glass elevator, they turned the top floor ballroom into La Poget French Eatery and they reopened it. Um, this is an article from the reopening. Um, and there was quite the fanfare of the reopening of the hotel. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, the Bruce Sunlins and the Michael Metcalfs and the Buddy Ciancis of the world were really not representative of the people of Providence or the people of Rhode Island in the sense that expensive French eateries and very expensive rooms um, were not profitable uh, during the early 1980s. Um, the hotel was in way over its head and it spent about 20 more years from that point forward trying to stay afloat. It had a very, very difficult time staying afloat, but it did manage to do so throughout the 90s and early 2000s. Um, Buddy Sancy did all sorts of strange things. 
Um, he, uh, well, and he, as you know, he did lots of strange things in general. Um, but in regard to the hotel, he even had this sign, um, which I apologize on the slide is not super clear, um, installed on the side of the building that said, uh, welcome to Providence, the safest city in the continental United States. That was not true by any means, um, but he figured if he could put up a sign, maybe people would believe it, it would help people get excited to stay at the hotel. Um, he also invited Hollywood to film in the city and at the hotel. He invited all sorts of people and he always comped their rooms even though he didn't have the right to do that. Um, he racked up quite a bill that he never paid. Um, he actually racked up such a large bill, um, mostly because during Operation Plunderdome, when he was being investigated for racketeering out of the mayor's office, he moved into the Biltmore as a resident. Um, when Buddy Cianci went to prison, he dropped off his key at the front desk and he said, I'll be back. Um, to my knowledge, um, he didn't really ever go back to the Biltmore, at least not to stay. Um, but I do posit in my book that if you're into ghost stories and you believe in ghosts, I'm kind of on the fence about that stuff. Um, I would say Buddy Cianci is definitely the, the one who would be haunting the Biltmore. He spent more time wheeling and dealing and threatening people and eating and drinking and smoking and having a wonderful time and launching his marinara line at the hotel than anyone else. Um, so I only can imagine that after they closed his casket at City Hall, he probably just um, got up and walked across the street and went right back to his favorite bar. This is what the hotel looks like today. Um, in 2018, it was purchased by AJ Capital Partners, a uh, investment company and hotel chain out of Chicago. They purchase historic and um, needing renovation buildings and hotels across the country in college towns. Um, and then they rebrand them as graduate name the city. Uh, so graduate Cambridge, graduate uh, Chapel Hill, graduate Princeton, graduate um, Providence. I love this photo because I think it really gives you a sense of how far the, the hotel has come. Um, at the very top, starting at the top, you can see the original ceiling, the original gold-plated ceiling with Egyptian carvings. Um, people were really into King Tut in the early uh, 20th century, so everything had all these very Egyptology themes. Um, coming down the three-tiered mezzanine with the glass elevator right through the middle, which was Buddy Cianci's idea and well, him and um, some of the designers, um, very futuristic. Um, and then coming to this uh, ground floor, which looks exactly like every other hotel I think in the world now, um, just with the bland carpets and kind of boring furniture. Um, certainly not something John Bowman would have been excited about, but each level of this photograph shows you a different layer of the history of the hotel. The hotel, I do believe, is in good hands. Um, I had the opportunity to interview uh, the management from the graduate hotel chain, and I will say they love this building. They love the historic aspect of it. Um, they, have, they were very supportive of my work, and um, I think that they have every intention of maintaining the hotel for a long time, um, though change is inevitable and hotels get sold and that's what happens. Um, I do hope that for um, Rhode Island's sake that the building stays standing. I hope it remains a hotel or at least is preserved. Um, it is a stunningly beautiful building, but it is also a vessel of stories. Um, and it is really truly a testament to um, how far Rhode Island uh, has come um, through all of the bumps and ups and downs and changes. Um, it is still standing in the center of a still beautiful and prosperous city. And I think um, that is, uh, a true testament to time, especially with the amount of ups and downs in this um, manufacturing town. So uh, it was really a pleasure to get to know the state of Rhode Island through my research. It was an honor to tell some local stories that I was able to dig up on some people that I think have never had their stories told before and others who hopefully I did justice, they've had their stories told, but maybe not my way. Um, so I highly recommend if you uh, move to a new town to try to write a book about it because uh, you will get to know that town very, very well, very, very quickly. Um, I am happy to say I am now friends with um, people who are in the Cianci family, the Patriarcha family, and uh, many other families in between, um, if you think that there's much space between those two. Um, so I will say it was a wonderful journey writing this, and I do hope that you have an opportunity to read it and enjoy it. Thank you.
Um, I have time for questions if anybody has any or stories about the Biltmore. Yeah. I saw a matchbook that referred to the, the garden. Yes, the garden room. Garden room. Was that actually outdoors? Um, it was not. The garden room is um, now called the Capitol Ballroom. It was on the second floor. It's a, it's a smaller ballroom, but it's quite beautiful. Um, and it's on the second floor of the hotel. Um, it was actually in that postcard of the breakfast at the Biltmore. That would have been the garden room there. It was not. No, it wasn't. They had a terrace restaurant for a little while, which was over the lobby um, on the front of the hotel. Uh, I think that's come in and out of fashion. You mean like the third story yes. kind of triangle shape there? Yes, yep. Oh. But they've never had a formal, full outdoor space, other than the, the zoo on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Do you have any interest in doing a tour, taking people through the building? Ooh. I mean, maybe. Um, it's so funny because now it's so different. <coughs> there, are, there are really interesting uh, I think I would rather give talks at the hotel because I think wandering up and down a hotel hallway, everything kind of looks the same. Um, but sitting in a room like the ballroom where Charles Lindbergh, you know, had dinner, or where president, many, many, many presidents, all of the presidents have been, um, or just where really interesting parties were held and weddings and proms and debutante balls, um, that's more compelling to me, perhaps. Um, but. Uh, no, I also, as much as I love talking about my book, I don't think I'm much of a tour guide. I get very long-winded and go down very weird rabbit holes about things I think are interesting that other people might not, so. Well, speaking of rabbit holes, did you um, end up reading any other books that were written by, about specific hotels, like the Hotel Dell in California, or? I read The Plaza by Julie Sato, which is about the Plaza Hotel in New York. Um, actually, I read that book when I had just started my research and I turned to my husband and I said, this is the book I want to write, but she's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. So I don't think I'm going to be able to um, do it quite justice, but her book is really beautifully written. Um, she does a great job of weaving history and stories together and making it very compelling, even if you're not from New York or even if you're not interested in hotel history. Um, and then I read a number of the History Presses volumes uh, which are, like mine, written by local authors um, of different hotels. Um, uh, I read a couple about um, hotels in Colorado um, and Texas and a few other places that were built around the same time, mostly for context. Yes? It seems like uh, in the 20s, this hotel was competing against what was going on here in Newport. And yes. so I'm surprised when you say there's not a good hotel. Yeah. That there certainly had to have been the Viking, or I don't know about the Viking Hotel in yeah. history, but yes. it seems like that hotel would have, you wouldn't have to go all the way to New York to find right. a decent hotel. It seems but it was took, it actually took a long time to get to Newport. Right. So I think, I think that um, it was, we think of Newport as sort of being 45 minutes from Providence, but at the time it was two or three hours. Oh, yeah. So sure. I think because of that, you are absolutely right, Newport was the creme de la creme. It was um, the center of affluence, um, and it was also the world's playground. Um, however, uh, business was not being done in Newport. Play was being done in Newport. So um, the problem with Providence was that that's where all the business people and they were going to the mills and the factories to look at their investments and they were sitting in boardrooms and then they were having to get in stagecoaches and go out to Newport or go to Connecticut or Boston. Um, the Viking is a really cool hotel. I had the opportunity to stay there recently and it has a brilliant history as well. Um, but when, it was, when was that hotel built? It was built, oh, it's older. It was built in the late 1800s. Oh. So um, I believe, I, I, I'll check that date, don't quote me. But um, it is older than the Biltmore and um, I think what's important about that is that it has much more of a historical lore. This was built to be, now we think of it as historic, but very technologically advanced. They wanted the pneumonic tube systems and the air conditioning. And I mean, it had all of these things that were very new at the time. Um, refrigeration for different guest use and things like that, um, which older, more colonial style hotels did not have. What were the pneumatic tubes used for? Um, sending your uh, private packages throughout the hotel. So if you were sitting on the fifth floor in a meeting, uh, like let's say you were in a union and you were having a union meeting, you could 
sign a bunch of documents and send them down to the notary public on the mezzanine level, have them notarized and send back to your meeting, things like that. Um, you could also send mail that way, you could send packages from your 15th floor suite down. Keeping in mind people lived there, they didn't want to take the elevator down every time they needed to drop something off or be sent a cigar from the cigar stand. Um, so these tubes were zipping through the walls all the time. Um, the original mail chute that would have held one of the pneumatic tubes is actually still along one of the elevator lines in the hotel. It's quite cool. They have that at the Viking too, so you don't have to go all the way across to see it. Would they maybe have used it if you wanted to buy something from the store? Yes, definitely. Um, and so you would ring, you would ring down, and someone would either appear at your door and ask you what you wanted, or um, they had various ways throughout the 1920s to get in touch with the first floor. Um, there was definitely a bellhop on every floor who could also take your order, and then something could be sent up to you. Keep in mind that these were these were the Astors and the Vanderbilts. They were not just going downstairs and getting an apple, you know. So like they needed these things. <coughs> right down the street from. The I'm not as familiar with it, but I think Newport really had some of the most beautiful historic hotels. I'm not it's sure how very, many. Very Victorian. Yes, and I, I think um, Newport has done a better job at preserving its old buildings than almost any town in the country, actually. Um, and it's very well known for that outside of Rhode Island, of course, as well as inside Rhode Island. <laughs>